Like I said, welcome to our um, program tonight with Glenn Kreisberg. Um, his topic is Native American Stone Structures of the Catskill Mountains as Ceremonial Landscapes. Uh, for those of you that uh, don't know about the Historical Society of Woodstock, we are a member supported and volunteer managed historical society. Uh, for more information, I've put our website in the chat box. You can uh, see that. And um, Glenn, who is a great friend of the Historical Society, has been a student of these ancient stone structures and their purpose and origins for decades. And I had the great honor of doing one of Glenn's hikes in, I believe, I hate to say it was 2017, but I went up there with a great curiosity and I came, I think I came back with more questions <laughs> than answers, <laughs> but um, it, was a, it was a wonderful experience. And so we're glad you're here to sh share your knowledge of these astounding phenomenon. Uh, if there are any questions while Glenn is giving his presentation, please enter them in the chat box um, and I'll monitor that and alert Glenn that there's a question that uh, someone has. So I'm gonna turn it over to Glenn Kreisberg. Thank you again for everyone for being here. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I do wanna thank you for attending. I wanna thank Janine, uh, Historical Society President for helping put this together. Uh, Richard Hepner, the town historian, is behind the scenes uh, working the levers on Zoom, so I want to thank Richard as well. And um, start off talking about uh, decoding the cultural stone landscapes in our region and what, what, what exactly that all means. And I'll start with a fact that part of the 1880 U.S. Census actually included what was called an agricultural stone fence survey. And it was of New England, so it didn't actually include New York, but just for New England, they recorded as part of that survey over 240,000 miles of stone walls in the Northeast. So if you think about that, that's enough stone wall to reach to the moon or to wrap around the earth 10 times. That's a lot of stone walls to have been built um, since the period of time when the Europeans arrived and when that census was taken in 1880. So to me, that indicates that some of those stone constructions were probably present on the landscape um, in pre-colonial pre and pre-contact times. And that, that's kind of um, the interest that we're focusing on. And of course, anybody who lives in our area that goes walking in the woods, it's not gonna take them very long before they come across something that's really interesting and made of stone, whether it's an old uh, foundation um, or cellar hole or an old stone wall or an unusual pile of stones um, or an unusual boulder set up in a particular way we certainly have our share of unusual stone features that are in the woods around this area. And what I'd like to do is, is look at some of those and try to understand them in their proper cultural context. So uh, I think it was March of 2019, Overlook Mountain Center got a, a small grant from New York Humanities and invited Doug Harris, who's the Deputy Tribal Preservation, uh, Historic Preservation Officer for the Narragansett Tribe in Rhode Island to come and talk to us about ceremonial stone landscapes, um, how to identify and protect them, and uh, you know, also to uh, understand their meaning and, and try to get an understanding of what these things are. So, you know, Doug says, let the landscape speak in, in uh, Algonquin Narragansett dialect, Manitou Hasanesh is the word for these sites, spirit stones. Uh, these are in many senses considered pr prayers in stones, uh, hence the spirits. And a lot of the type of work that I've done is kind of follow-up work on the work of James Maver and Byron Dix, uh, two uh, early NERA members who were very much into documenting the, the sacred landscape of New England's native civilization. So just the concept of a native civilization in the Northeast is a little controversial because depending on what you consider the qualities of a civilization and, and the sophistication of it, um, you know, some things fall into that category and others don't culturally, but for Maver and Dix, uh, who are no lightweights, Maver, by the way, was a naval architect at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, and he led ar archeological excavations in the Mediterranean. Byron Dix was an optics engineer for NASA. And, you know, in their spare time, they documented uh, stone sites in the woods of New England uh, as part of their nearer, nearer activities. So we talk about archaeoastronomy and landscape archaeology. 
Um, these are concepts that are pretty much accepted worldwide. Archaeoastronomy is how ancient people use the sky in their belief system and in their uh, keeping track of timing and of the seasons and of the planting. So it's a pretty well documented uh, activity that ancient people observed the sky and in many cases created monuments to represent uh, what they were viewing, memorialize it, and then help incorporate it into their worldview and belief system. So in this picture, we see uh, Stonehenge, which everyone is familiar with. On the top right, we have um, Malta, the Mandara Temple on the island of Malta in the Mediterranean, which is one of the oldest solar calendars in the world. Bottom left um, is also another solar calendar. It's either Chaco Canyon or somewhere in Peru. I'm slipping my mind at the moment. And on the bottom right, we have a, a chamber, a megalithic chamber in Putnam County. Uh, here's a closer view of that chamber. I believe this is the King's Chamber. On the winter solstice on sunrise, you see the light dagger, the light phenomenon that occurs in that chamber um, with the rising sun shining a shaft of light into the entrance and shining on the back wall. So these are different kinds of aspects of archaeoastronomy and landscape archaeology that make up ceremonial stone landscapes in our region. Now, um, there is a, uh, a professor from Harvard named Gary Urton, and uh, he's, I believe, the chair of anthropology there. And he studies um, the, the uh, Incan and, and South American cultures, but he's also familiar with the research that we have up in this region. And he's written many books, uh, some of which have titles like um, uh, at, the, at the Intersection of Earth and Sky or Landscapes and Skyscapes cosmologies of ancient Native Americans. So what is Professor Erton talking about when he's talking about a landscape? Well, his definition of landscape is something that represents a living synthesis between the people and the land that they inhabit. And then he goes on to say that a skyscape is a landscape that includes a portion of the sky or horizon from which a cultural story can be constructed. So those are kind of important points to keep in mind when talking about landscape archaeology and archaeoastronomy and how people related to the sky in ancient times. Now, officially a ceremonial stone landscape, according to the United Southern and Eastern Tribes and the resolution passed in 2007, they say within the ancestral territories of tribes in the Northeast or in the East, uh, there exist sacred ceremonial stone landscapes and their stone structures, which are part of particular cultural value to certain tribe members. They go on to say for thousands of years before immigration of Europeans, the medicine people of the Uset tribal ancestors used these sacred landscapes to sustain the people's reliance on mother nature and the spirit energies of balance and harmony. And whether these stone structures are massive or small structures, stacked stones, stone rows or walls or effigies, these prayers in stone are often mistaken by archaeologists and state historic preservation officers as the efforts of farm clearing and uh, stones for agriculture and wall building purposes. So they don't typically in the Northeast get recognized for what they are. And that's because of what I call the problem, the accepted view. And this is from Herbert Kraft's book um, from 2001. So it's already 20 years old, but it's what you would find in a uh, college course on Native American studies. There's absolutely no proof that man-made megaliths or dolmens with or without grave objects or any other manifestation of old world funerary constructions or astronomical alignments exist in Lenape or in territory or in the Northeast. And the burden of proof is on those who make such claims. And thus far, every claim has been unsupported satisfactorily to uh, scientific evidence. So that's kind of the challenge that was thrown down. And I've been trying to uh, get that to um, and and I'm, I'm not alone, there are other researchers as well that see the flaw in that and are trying to get that changed. What's interesting about how Native Americans are taught in our schools, elementary schools, uh, I certainly was taught that way years ago, and I still think it's the case, that we learn about Native Americans as something from the past, not something from the present, certainly not something in the future. But the fact is that it's very much in the present and very much part of our culture today and the culture in the years ahead. Uh, and we can learn a lot from understanding um, 
how to harness and, and, and use for beneficial purposes the energies of, of balance and harmony. So some of the progress that's been made has uh, took place at Colgate University um, in 2014. There was a conference that was held there called the Stars and Stones Symposium. It was uh, hosted by Anthony Avini, who is kind of America's uh, premier archaeoastronomer, although none of his work is in the Northeast. It's all in Mesoamerica. Lori Rush, who's the cultural preservation, uh, cultural resource manager for Fort Drum up in the Adirondacks. And she found something very interesting up in Fort Drum that she reported to Anthony Avini. And it turned out to be a ceremonial stone landscape with astronomy associated with it. And he, uh, he called this, this uh, symposium at Colgate, which I attended, which was fascinating because it brought together for the first time, three groups of people that had never been in the same room. Uh, and by the way, this was held at the Kung Ho Visualization Center, which is a, a really beautiful uh, high-tech planetarium that allows you to project, you know, uh, the stars in the sky going back tens of thousands of years um, for everybody to, to visualize and see. So uh, at that symposium, you had the academics from Colgate and other universities who were able to attend. You also had regulators from um, state and, and, uh, and federal uh, agencies like Fish and Wildlife, like Department of Agriculture, the Park Service, the um, Forest Service, all those officials, uh, Nancy Herter from the New York State Department um, or, or uh, Historic Preservation Office. Um, and you also had the Native American uh, uh, Historic Tribal Preservation people. And what came from this, as these stories were told and these sites were shared, was that the regulators, the state and federal archeologists and, and administrators had to basically admit that none of this was on their radar in the Northeast that, uh, let me see. We have some people in the waiting room waiting for I us. see that, I'm gonna admit them all. Thank you for learning Sorry that. about the interruption, folks. That's okay, Sorry. they they made me the, uh, the host, so I have to do the admitting and I'm admitting all right now, or at least I'm trying to. Okay, and I'm muting all as well. Okay, so, and let me minimize that. So yes, all these regulators uh, and, and, um, and even some of the academics basically had to uh, admit that they had no sensitivity to archaeoastronomy or landscape archaeology in the Northeast, though they knew about it almost everywhere else uh, where it occurs. And, and certainly it's uh, not questioned in the Southeast or in, in the Midwest, places like Cahokia, the Mississippian and, and Adena cultures in the Southwest, the, the Hopi and the Anastasi, Central and South America, all ancient cultures are credited with watching the sky, observing the sky and creating monuments to represent their beliefs um, related to, to the sky and what they observe. So the Northeast was kind of left out of that for a number of reasons, but it's beginning to catch up. And um, Anthony Avini's uh, and Laurie Rush's symposium went a long way towards raising awareness and uh, just a little uh, news we can make here, there is a uh, Stars and Stones Symposium 2 that's being planned for this December at Colgate to follow up on the first one and to update everybody on the, on the work. So my methodology is to keep track of these sites, uh, plot their uh, location with latitude and longitude, all their different features. Uh, and what that allows us to do is to sort and filter and look for certain patterns, concentrations, and distributions of these sites and their features that uh, line up with each other. And when you plot them, you do see the concentrations and the distribution. And on the bottom right, east of the Hudson, you have uh, all the chambers in Putnam and Northern Westchester and Southern Dutchess County, hundreds of chambers actually in that region. And uh, west of the Hudson, you have the sites in the Catskills, there's Red Flags and then the Shuangunks. Um, and then when I plot them and I look for patterns in relationships between their location, what I found was that many of them seem to align along a similar azimuth or bearing with each other, either with line of sight or non-line of sight. And it's not just bearing that is, um, and, and what, we're, what we're looking at here is a chart provided by Curtis Hoffman on the left. It's showing 
the azimuths of the summer solstice to sunrise and the winter solstice to sunset and the winter solstice to sunrise and summer solstice to sunset. And you can see the angles involved with the alignments here in the Northeast and the Catskills are basically those same bearings, those same azimuths as how these sites align. So that's, that's a very interesting pattern that you can't ignore. As you close in on that in our region, um, you see in the town of Woodstock, uh, all these sites are pretty much aligned along that, that bearing. I'm gonna just read them out. It's 57.6 degrees Northeast is the summer solstice sunrise, 122 uh, to the Southeast for the winter solstice sunrise. The winter solstice sunset is about 237 and the summer solstice sunset is about 303. So you see it's a reciprocal. The, the uh, winter solstice sunrise is 180 degrees from the summer solstice sunset. Um, so it, it, these are important uh, degrees and bearings to, to recognize, to figure out what is or what isn't potentially aligned with the solstice alignment. So we see this line passing through the Catskills, Lewis Hollow, Mink Hollow, Silver Hollow, goes through Devil's Tombstone up to Screwston Valley. And we're going to, um, here's a little closer look at Professor Hoffman's chart. Curtis Hoffman's a professor of archeology span at UMass. What's important to realize here is these are um, true bearings, not magnetic, excuse me. So at our latitude, about 42 degrees north of the equator, you'd actually have to add about 14, between 14 and 15 degrees um, to that azimuth that you see there to get to the magnetic bearings you'd see on a compass. So uh, what I've done here is also put the lunar standstills, uh, minimum and maximum, which are seven degrees off from the solstice. That's a cycle that happens every 18.6 years. And it's important on Native American sites because the Native Americans very much follow the lunar cycle uh, as opposed to a solar one, though they did certainly observe solstices and uh, equinox sunrises, um, important. So this is just putting it into a little bit of a 3D perspective from a viewing point, uh, basically any viewing point, you'd be looking over monuments towards the sun's position, or it could be the, the moon's position, or it could be a rising star's position at a particular uh, azimuth on a particular date of the year that had meaning for the people who set these types of things up. And this is a little bit more of an in-depth look at some of the azimuths and alignments, um, not just solstice sunrises and sunsets and lunar maximum standstills and minimums, um, but we also have entrances and exits to the sky world, which were important bearings and to the uh, exits and entrances to the underworld. And if you look closely, you'll see that the entrance from the sky world is reciprocal to the exit to the underworld and vice versa for the entrance from the underworld is reciprocal to the exit to the sky world. So you kind of have to um, you know, wrap your head around that a little bit. Um, still admitting folks here. So what I'm gonna try to do is walk you through some of these sites and give you a tour of them, uh, beginning with the Mink Hollow site. We'll look at some sites in the Catskills and then we'll look at some in the, in the Shuangunks. Um, and Mink Hollow is basically right on the uh, Green County, Ulster County line. It was an important thoroughfare. Mink Hollow Road was a major north-south uh, travel corridor for people going back thousands and thousands of years, probably right up until the automobile was invented. And then uh, they took the road around and, and it ended up becoming a DEC trail. But if you go up into Mink Hollow and you know where to look, and it's not right on the trail, it's off the trail, a little bit of a bushwhack, you start to find these really interesting stone formations. And there, they're pretty uniform. They're about a meter high, maybe a meter and a half tall. Um, some of them are in rows here. Uh, as you can see, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor as I move it along, but these three cairns are in a row. And you can tell these dry stack piles are not just farmers getting stones out of the way. There's some care and thought into how these were constructed. Uh, many of them are on um, bedrock foundations as this one is. This also has a wall trailing away from it. So it potentially could be seen as a serpent effigy with the wall being the body of the snake and the head being the boulder with the cairn stacked on top of it. This is another pattern that we see throughout the Northeast, serpent effigies, turtle effigies. We'll talk a little bit more about that. So there's some beautiful walls up in Mink Hollow uh, this one points to a spot uh, on the horizon that is oriented south and east 
I have not been there on a um, winter solstice to see if the sunrise is over where that is pointing. But you can see the, the beautiful quality of the construction of this wall. Uh, it would take a lot for this thing to be brought down. I've seen large, very large trees fall over walls similar to this and not even put a dent in them. Though I've also seen other trees fall and, and, and leave a mark and, and do some damage. So that is, uh, they're not mutually exclusive. Trees can fall and do nothing or they can fall and cause destruction. What's somewhat unusual about this wall is on one side, it's a wall, but on the other side, the land comes right up to the top. So in, in fact, it's almost like a terrace. You can see this is the downslope side and on the back side, the land literally comes up to the top of the wall and then it drops to a lower level. So what that's all about, I honestly can't tell you. I just know it took a tremendous amount of effort to build this type of construction in the woods. And I, I do believe it's uh, pre-colonial. Uh, you can tell by the size of the trees, this area was obviously logged fairly recently. Uh, no big trees, everything that is large was too small or a sapling last time the area was logged. And this particular wall, um, or I should say this section of it, because it dog legs about as far as you can see in the, in the front there, it makes a bend to the right, which was the section I photographed pointing to the uh, horizon. But this piece of the wall um, runs perfectly due north-south on the compass, which also is, is um, a little unusual, but not uh, unheard of because we do see these many times aligned north-south and east-west. Um, as in compass bearings. Also in Minkalo, in one of the Cairns, we found an oyster shell on a pedestal. So to me, this is very telling. Um, it has to do with the hydrology of the site. And, um, and we see that a lot of these sites are found in hollows. And these are the sources of the streams. Many of the springs and streams that flow into the creeks and into the rivers that go to the ocean start in these hollows and it's because of the the geography they're like big you know um funnels and all of the surface water gets funneled into a stream um and i think the very very headwaters of these uh the sources of these uh streams are are marked by carrots because in almost every case where you come to a headwater of a creek that fill, feeds a stream that feeds a river you're finding uh Cairns, and in that particular case, you're finding a cairn with an oyster shell in it, probably from from the uh, from the Hudson River um, that used to have oysters, uh, you know, many years ago. So, you also in the hollows you have folded and fractured bedrock, and what the fractured and folded bedrock in the hollows does is that those fractures and fissures in the bedrock allow the water in the aquifers below to work their way up and to create springs on the surface. So even when some of these, um, for example, in Lewis Hollow, the creek dries up, it's an intermittent stream, even on the DEC chart, it shows it as intermittent. There are times of the year where um, it's completely dry, but there are springs also in Lewis Hollow that are never dry. There are spring houses up there, and we'll, we'll talk to that when we look a little closer at that site. Um, we're gonna move over to um, Silver Hollow now, a little bit west of Mink Hollow. And this is a site that includes mega walls and cairns. Mega walls meaning double walls that are filled between with rubble. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I mark where these are. Uh, I note their elevation. I note their latitude and longitude and when, we were, when we visited them. And this one was nicely mapped out by David Holden, uh, one of my uh, co-conspirators in, in researching these in the, in the woods. And he did a terrific job of mapping this out and all the different features of these north-south running walls and, and, and bulging walls and curving walls that have graceful curves built into them. And then there's a large cairn field to the east with 20 foot high conical cairns. And here's an example of this mega wall. Uh, you know, that upper stone probably weighs close to four or 500 pounds. Uh, it's, it's almost six feet off the ground. This wall is nearly 12 feet altogether. Um, that's a, um, I believe that's an eight foot post. And here we get a better look at some of these walls, and some of the sweeping curves of them. You can see there are double walls filled with rubble in between. So this is quite an undertaking, quite a, a construction project. And here we have one of the conical cairns. Um, they're about 20 feet across and about 20 feet tall. Another one of the walls, this one is not in quite as good shape. Um, the uh, 
the, the azimuth tool showing that it's oriented east-west. And what I want to point out here is if you notice these Karens on the far right, I'm going to bring up the, bring up the Ulster County LIDAR. And you can actually see in the LIDAR, uh, even though it's not the greatest resolution, you can see uh, th these Karens are in a circular configuration. You can see the north-south running walls, some of the east-west walls, a little more faint. But when I was observing the, the uh, LIDAR, I noticed these, these stone piles over here off to the east. Uh, I'm going to look at them a little more closely because there's a series of them. And, and they basically run perfectly east-west in a straight line. Uh, and I circled where, where you can see them. I haven't been out to investigate them, but they seem to, if you notice, they, they run right over to the, uh, the site here in Silver Hollow, where the Karens and the walls are. So I don't know if there's a series of these that go over towards Mink Hollow, which is just basically off to the east here a little bit further. Um, and it, it could be something that connects the two sites. So also in Silver Hollow, another Karen with a niche in it. This one did not have uh, any type of pedestal or, or oyster shell in it, but it did have an opening oriented in a particular direction. And here's another beautiful Karen in Silver Hollow built on a foundation of bedrock. And these always hold up much better. When we find Karens that are uh, disintegrated, basically they have not been built on on bedrock foundations and they're subject to uh, frost heaves and the cycles of frost and, and thaw and freezing and contraction and expansion that knocks these things over. Now we're gonna look at Bearsville Hollow. Um, Bearsville also in Woodstock. And here we have a few dozen cairns located between stone walls. Um, many of these appear to have a turtle feature to them. Uh, is the location on the map just west of town. And here you can see what you know looks like a pretty obvious turtle aspect to this thing uh, with the shell on top and the, and the head tucked in. Another one with a large boulder dead, you know, center bottom, which could represent the head. Another one, you can see the walls in the background. Another one, the turtle cairn with the head tucked in, maybe some paws or paddles off to the side. So there's a whole series of them up there many of them with this turtle aspect. Here's a couple of like, you know, turtles marching towards you. And turtles really shouldn't be that surprising at Native American uh, ceremonial sites because turtles were a big part of Native American mythology, I should say spirituality. Uh, part of their creation myth involves in many cases a turtle um, that has, uh, you know, after a worldwide flood or flood that engulfed the world um, or the world covered by water, an animal is sent down to put, you know, sometimes a beaver, sometimes a muskrat, sometimes some other type of animal and brings up a clump of dirt, plops it on the back of the turtle, repeats that process until you have what many Native Americans consider Turtle Island, which is North America, the entire continent. So Turtle Karens in Bearsville. And the kicker to this is right in the, in the center of this site is this major effigy, which to me looks like nothing but a giant turtle stone with that capstone on it. It's about 40 feet across and uh, in the woods behind it and up the hill are those cairns that we just looked at. And again, this is bringing up the fact that turtle effigies are fairly uh, common at these sites. We have one here in Spruceton Valley, in West Kill, uh, shown on the left, and another one in Killingsworth, Connecticut, uh, on the right. Um, not, you know, not too difficult. You don't have to use too much imagination to see a turtle uh, feature in these. And of course, we also have serpents and snake effigies that are also representative uh, of Native American beliefs. And this all uh, speaks to a connection to the underworld where serpents would reside and, and they, they um, you know, come to the surface and um, you know, that energy of the serpent um, was, was recognized not just by Native Americans, but by many, many ancient cultures around the world. Uh, we're now gonna go to Spruceton Valley and look at what's going on in Westkill. There are more turtle cairns up there. Um, this is located, uh, again, in the headwaters area of the Westkill Creek. The Westkill um, flows to the west, why it's called Westkill, and into the Schoharie. So it's actually a different watershed than um, Mink Hollow, which flows, uh, and the waters that flow out of Mink Hollow 
uh, I should say that's the, uh, I believe the beaver kill flies, flows to the Esopus, and then, you know, the Esopus em empties into the Hudson and flows down to the uh, to ocean. In West Kill, you've got a stream that runs to the Schoharie, which then flows to the Mohawk River. So it's a completely different watershed. And Native Americans, they didn't draw lines on maps the way Europeans did, separating um, states with the, or, or, you know, counties or pieces of property with the um, river or the stream as the border, because they recognize the entire watershed of that stream as a territory, not one side being one ter territory and the other side being another, that would make no sense to them. So it was all about the watersheds that were being served. So here we see the location of Spruceton Valley all the way at the end of um, Spruceton Valley Road in West Kill. And these are what you see if you go up there, uh, follow the DEC trail, really less than a half a mile from its end and know where to look in the woods. You start to see these, uh, these constructions. Again, very purposeful, uh, very turtle effigy-like. You see the head there on the left. We've already seen this example, the large head and the claw on the right and the left. And some of the constructions up in Spruceton have these really interesting niches in them, uh, little mini chambers that perhaps an offering could be left in, although I've never found anything in any of them. Uh, it certainly is a space where something could be left if somebody wanted to. And, and um, you know, part of these sites and the Native American belief system is that they were built, you know, as in some cases, burials or memorials. And this is a uh, also a multicultural phenomenon where you would cast a stone upon it and leave an offering each time you'd come near or, or uh, give a votive offering where you'd make a vow to remember. So these niches may represent places that offerings could be left like little altars. In fact, uh, this construction has what looks like an altar built right onto it. There's also wonderful walls up in Spruceton. Uh, they're single walls, but they're quite substantial. We have a moment for a question or two. I uh, absolutely. The one question was: uh, Did uh, have you found any mention of these in early histories? And uh, did the early settlers make uh, use of them? Uh, that's from Weston, uh, locally that you know of. Um. Yes, there is some mention when we do, and I haven't done it on the Spruceton site, but when we get to the Lewis Hollow site, which has been um, the uh, probably the most researched site in our region so far, um, we have found evidence in the, in the original deeds that reference ancient stone monuments, including stone walls, including piles of stone that were um, you know, uh, useful for the early surveyors. They're fortuitously placed, so they would use it as a corner. But in most cases, if you do the deed research, you'll find that um, you don't find walls that line up with the boundaries. In some cases, absolutely, because many, many um, farms and many homesteads were bounded by stone walls. But deep in the woods where you find these constructions, and it's almost like um, doing the research at the, at the uh, real property tax office in the county office building, it's a process of elimination. You go back through the deeds uh, into the handwritten ones, and you see who owned the land, when, how the parcels were subdivided and cut up and do any of the walls conform with any of those surveys in their descriptions or their, or their um, deed maps. So, um, you know, in some cases, yes, and it's obvious. In other cases, there is no connection. So you have to um, kind of eliminate that as being a, um, a, a, a border or a boundary wall. Um, can, can you tell us which um, Native American society or nation was living in Ulster County at the time the Dutch took over when uh, maybe these might be related to someone asked? Um, yep, and we're going to get into that a little bit later okay. as well, but I would say generally the, the, the Lenape, the Esopus Indians were kind of a northern uh, branch of the um, uh, Muncie speaking Lenape. Um, so uh, it was, but, but quite honestly, it's a bit of a border region in, in Woodstock. Uh, mm -hmm. South, and uh, you have the, the Muncie and the, and the um, Lenape. Uh, west, you certainly had Iroquois influences. Uh, and North, you had Mohawk and, and Mohican, um, also a little to the east. So um, there definitely are native groups who have um, associated themselves with some of these sites. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we get towards the end of the program. So uh, as with Mink Hollow, you do see some of these sites lined, uh, some of these um, Karens lined up in rows. Um, am I heading in the right direction? Yes. And because the 
West Kill flows to the west where the sun sets uh, late in, in the uh, or on the solstice in, in, the, in the summer on the sh longest day of the year when the sun is setting, it shines its light deep into um, Spruceton Valley. And, and, and you know, you can be in there at 830 uh, on June 21st and this is what you're seeing. The sun is shining uh, in strongly as it's about to set on the horizon to the uh, to the north and the west at about 303 degrees. Um, we're going to look at Halcott Mountain now, which is uh, very close to uh, Spruceton Valley. It's on Route 42 between um, Shandaken and, and uh, Lexington. Beautiful waterfall. This is the source of the uh, Bushnellville Kill. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Uh, Bushnellville is the town right there. And this is the stream that flows off of uh, Halcott Mountain. Um, I guess my dog Smudge was with me on that visit. Here again, you see similar cairns to what we see in Mink Hollow and in Spruceton Valley um, and in Bearsville, um, maybe a, a meter and a half or a meter high and a meter and a half across, uh, also marking springs and headwaters. And, you know, here we've got a cairn that's sitting right on top of a spring that's flowing out from underneath it, coming out from the hillside behind, probably uh, being put, pressed down the mountain by hydrostatic pressure. Uh, and emerging below this cairn where the land levels out and marked by this cairn. <clears throat> and you can see the, the, the lush green around these cairns because of the springs that are flowing down the hill. This is early springtime and you can see this hillside is covered with green um, leafy foliage and that's due to the springs and the waters that are flowing down that hillside. And again, it's marked by these cairns, which are in my opinion, marking the headwaters of the uh, Bushnellville Kill, which flows down into the Esopus and then to the uh, to the uh, Hudson and out to the Atlantic Ocean. And just up the road where Spruceton Valley was, just a few miles away, you, you're flowing into the, the uh, Skullharry watershed. So the, this could certainly be a, a boundary uh, area marked by Cairns and also a headwaters um, uh, marking the springs and the Cairns. So, also a really impressive serpent wall there, a little hard to see in this picture, but just a, about a 120 foot wall, it's curving serpentine. Um, it's, a, it's a double wall filled with rubble in between. Uh, and I believe it represents a serpent or a snake effigy. At the end of it, on the far end, what you see here um, is the close end, but at the far end, actually the double wall for a, uh, a six foot section just goes to a single wall. So you kind of have to question why um, the tail, and I consider that the tail, maybe the rattle, uh, you know, why they would build this double wall, two walls filled with rubble, but then in a six foot section at the end of it, leave it uh, only single, uh, kind of makes you wonder. And this is looking down that wall, standing on top of it. Um, again, a little difficult to see, but this wall really has a look of, um, of age to it. Like it's a, a, quite an ancient wall with the moss built on it. And another clue is this does not look like a European or a Eurocentric built wall. European walls are a little more orderly than this, uh, a little more um, horizontal in their courses and, and you know, a little more lateral. Um, and, and this is uh, a serpent wall up in Halcott Mountain photographed in the wintertime. Uh, you know, you can really see the aesthetic of the curve and it's not an enclosure, it really serves no practical purpose. So that's another clue that it might be symbolic. And, and representative of a belief system. <clears throat> They're still popping in, I'm <laughs> still admitting. All right, we're gonna move over um, to the Shuangungs now for a little bit and look at uh, Sky Top, a beautiful area near the Mohonk Mountain House. Probably most everybody is familiar with it. Um, behind the Smiley Tower up there is Lily Pond. And behind Lily Pond is what I call the Lily Pond Stone. Now somebody sent me this actual picture of the stone and thought I'd have an interest in it, which I certainly did because it's a large boulder, probably eh, 15 tons, uh, you know, six feet tall at least, probably 10 feet across, set on some base stones. And um, it's similar to another stone just a, a few miles north on Bontecue called the North Shuangan Dolmen. I don't have it in this presentation, but it's also a very large stone set on smaller stones beneath. Now, what's interesting about this is you see this little triangle over here on the right at the base. We went up there, this is the opposite side. 
and I've had people tell me it looks like the head of a turtle, but we were up here um, on the summer solstice in 2017, just before sunset. Um, this was, uh, I think it was the 18th of June, not the 20th, but solstice means uh, st sun still. So the sun actually stands still in the same position on the solstice for three or four days on either side of the solstice before it starts making its journal journey back uh, you know, to the other terminus. So in the uh, summer, it's the furthest north. In the winter, it's the furthest south. So on the uh, solstice position, you see this shaft of light that shines into the base of this large boulder uh, from the northwest, where you would expect the um, summer solstice sun to set. And when it does, it projects a, a, a triangular uh, light projection, a light phenomenon onto the base of the stone. That's normally dark. If I go back here, you see that it's just a dark shadowed area, but on the solstice, it lights up with this, this triangle, this equilateral triangle um, that some people say could represent um, uh, the people who built it. If they were the earliest people to inhabit the area, they may have had a belief in um, goddess uh, fertility. And this type of triangle sometimes can be seen as a symbol of, of sacred feminine. Um, but the fact that it, it creates this glow hole uh, just on the solstice. And when you put the, the, the uh, azimuth tool on it, you see that it's 303 degrees, which is exactly what you'd expect a true bearing to be on the summer solstice. And um, this captures that quite nicely. So again, I think this is you know, evidence that this type of um, landscape archeology span was being done by somebody at some point in the past and I tend to think it was from the earliest people who came into the region, who were um, probably seafaring people who came from the East, already had a strong belief system built um, around, uh, you know, being able to navigate by the stars and the sky uh, as early maritime cultures would have been. So this is Bontecue Crag, also on the Mohawk Preserve, um, a little bit north of Sky Top, beautiful uh, cliff if people, there's a trail that takes you right up it. Uh, if you're there this time of year, this is the fall, but if you're there now, you'd probably see all this um, uh, mountain laurel with green bloom, this stuff on the right, probably be bright pink. Um, and it's a beautiful scramble up there. This is the summit of Bontecu Crag. And this is a stone that caught my uh, attention after coming up to this uh, summit, um, if not dozens, maybe a hundred times. My friend Ian was sitting having a snack against the stone and I said, man, that stone's been moved. That's not where it originally was. You can see very obviously that this stone has been shifted in its position in the bedrock. And um, you know you can see where the old position, you know this corner lined up with here. You can see the lichen, that pattern has changed since the position of the stone has been moved. You can see uh, where it's been shifted in the bedrock. Now who did this and why? Um, and it's, it's also a very triangular shaped stone which I, I've seen in, in other cases. So that point has been shifted. And you can see that it is now pointing in a different direction than it was originally. And it's pointing a little, you know, right around 60 degrees, which is close to that 57 degree bearing on Curtis Hoffman's chart of where you would expect the summer solstice to sunrise to be. So um, whoop, two people in the waiting room, let me get them in. Okay, so, um, you know, my job is to go up there on the solstice in the morning uh, and see if we get an alignment with where the sun is uh, close to the horizon after sunrise. And sure enough, where this stone is pointing to on the horizon now, after it's been shifted, is where you see the sunrise um, on June 21st, the longest day of the year. So again, to me, this is representative of somebody trying to um, memorialize a belief system and a, and a worldview into a monument uh, that they constructed or, or manipulated that's part of the natural landscape. Um, so uh, we're gonna look at one more stone. If that, if that stone is a calendar stone, then this stone I would call a compass stone. This also seems to have been purposely set up on smaller stones beneath. It's on a, it's on a ridge top with commanding views in 360 degrees. This is, um, 
near the Peterskill Preserve, uh, kind of near the border of uh, Mohonk Preserve and Minnewaska uh, territory. And uh, when I put my compass on this, you can see it has very definite points that are oriented uh, north very closely, uh, south and west. So a compass stone uh, that purposely set up that's oriented to cardinal directions, uh, you know, who did it and when, you can't really say, but it's certainly an interesting pattern that we see. I mentioned earlier this North Shuangan Dolmen um, that's not in this presentation, but it's also uh, both a compass and a calendar stone in that it has major points and faces that are oriented to the cardinal directions, yet it also aligns with another stone 18 miles away on Picamoose Mountain um, uh, for a winter solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset alignment along that, um, that bearing. So very interesting. Here you can see how the stone was set up. Um, the way I found this stone, I was hiking along the trail and I looked up on the ridge line and I saw a stone with some light passing beneath it. And that Im immediately caught my attention. So I kind of bushwhacked up to it and, and came upon this, this wonderful stone. Uh, we're gonna now move to uh, Marlboro Mountain in Platakill and a site that is known as Turtle Rock Ridge that I've uh, visited a few times now. It's um, quite an impressive site. It's got this giant turtle effigy. Um, it's actually a rock shelter inside is a cave. Um, we already talked about the significance of turtle effigies and uh, why it would be important to belief system of Native Americans. So this whole mountain is covered with uh, features that are very fascinating. It's a ridge top that continues. It's actually a, this, this ridge, Marlboro Mountain, is a part of a continuous ridge that comes uh, from down near Havistraw and High Tour Mountain up through Bear Mountain. Uh, Marlboro Mountain, where we are in, in this in this video, north of it is Shopanek Ridge, and north of that is the Sopus Ridge. And all of these ridge tops uh, west of the Hudson River have features on them that are related to Native Americans, and uh, it's actually to me a very significant cultural heritage corridor. This whole ridge top that runs from um, basically uh, where New York meets New Jersey down by the Palisades and all the way up to our region. Um, and what you have going on at this site, at this turtle effigy, is when the sun sets on the equinox uh, due west, you have a light phenomenon where the light from the setting sun on the equinox shines right into the turtle uh, effigy and, and shines behind the head of the, uh, you know, of, of that um, effigy. So that phenomenon, I think, is, uh, is important to understand and is, again, part of a pattern of these light phenomenon that occur at these sites on certain days of the year, like solstices and equinoxes. Now, if you keep exploring at um, Platakill Mountain and uh, Marlboro Mountain, Turtle Rock Ridge, you see um, glyphs. Here is a sun glyph, uh, a circle with some radiating lines out of it, um, highlighted here a little bit to show where that effigy is uh, or where that symbol is. Um, unfortunately, I increased the size of my picture and I screwed up my alignment. Uh, so it doesn't line up perfectly, but um, further up that ridge, you have this uh, winter solstice sunrise viewing portal. If you look through that, you can actually see Newburgh Bay and the Hudson River down to the south and east. And again, I haven't been there, but putting the compass on it, uh, it looks like a piece of landscape that has a portal in it that aligns with where the sun would rise on the shortest day of the year on the uh, winter equinox. So haven't been there to catch the sun coming through that, but I'm pretty certain uh, if I was there at the right time on the right day, that phenomenon could be recorded. Another really interesting inscription here, beneath the turtle effigy back at the rock shelter there, we see these two um, circles with tails leading away from them. This has been interpreted as comet, a cometary event uh, comets falling from the sky that have been inscribed uh, by somebody at some point uh, in the stone here. And, you know, I, I can see that other people don't necessarily see it, but if you go there and you inspect it, you can tell this has been chipped away on the rock surface, uh, very circular and tails leading away. So potentially a recording of a cometary event, um, who knows, maybe if it's old enough, it would be, uh, you know, 
connected to the Younger Dryas and whatever caused that uh, climate change event uh, 12,000 years ago. So um, another inscription, a cross hatch, uh, just to the left of the turtle head, not sure what that means, may have some kind of calendar connotation to it. And then there's also a second turtle effigy. This one, if you get on it and surf it, it rocks and, and it makes a resounding sound. So it could be a signal, um, you know, a signaling stone right on the top of the ridge, um, not, not, not too far from the uh, main turtle effigy. Um, so if we look at the position of where Marlboro Mountain and Turtle Rock Ridge is, off to the west there, um, to the east, and it, so it's about three and a half miles west of the Hudson River. And what you see on the Hudson River at that point, and I've kind of done an overview map here, is uh, Dan's Camera Point and the mouth of the Wapringer's Creek right across the way. So here's the, um, the map of it. You can see Dan's Camera Point, which unfortunately there's a major power plant there. Now they're discussing building another one, which is total insanity. Um, but if you look at the Wapringer's Creek and the mouth of it directly across the river, and, and, and we can go into why it was called Dan's Camera Point. And, and you know, there's some legend about when Hudson sailed up the river, they saw a large ceremony taking place on this point of land. Could have been the early, it was September, uh, September 9th, I think, 1609. Um, so it could have been the early corn harvest ceremony that were, was taking place there. But uh, we know it was a ceremonial center. Um, we never really knew why, but I think the relationship with the mouth of the Wappinger's Creek is going to explain to us why this was a ceremonial center for the, the Wappinger and the, the Lenape cousins who lived on the west side of the Hudson, uh, up and down the Hudson. Um, but when they sailed past it, legend has it, there was a large ceremony going on. Um, and of course, the Dutch, uh, being the good Calvinists they were, considered any Native American ceremonies to be de devil worshiping. Uh, so they named it Devil's Dance Chamber, uh, Duval Dance Camera, and it's still called Dance Camera Point, which in Dutch translates to Dance Chamber. Um, so they, they, you know, very early on, they painted the Native Americans with this negative devil worshiping um, uh, connotation or stigma, which, which unfortunately, uh, other, other areas in our region have that devil name. Uh, Devil's Tombstone, Devil's Acre, Devil's Kitchen, all these places in the Catskills. Uh, Devil's Dance Chamber here on the Hudson. And to me, devil is a clear giveaway. If the Dutch called it devil, it was a Native American ceremonial place. Uh, to me, that, that adds up. So um, if we look at the bearings from the very tip of Dan's Camera Point over to the mouth of the Wappinger's Creek, it lines up perfectly uh, 57 degrees. If we um, draw it on Google Earth, we see 57 degrees is the bearing on the very point to the mouth of the creek. And this is where it gets interesting because using Google Earth, you can actually model the sunrise at a particular time. So here we are June 21st at uh, very early in the morning, five in the morning on the summer sol solstice sunrise. It lines right up at that point on the horizon when viewed from Dan's camera. So to me, this is, this is strong evidence that the reason they um, use that point of land for the ceremonies was because of the relationship it had with the sky. Now, even more fascinating, from that point of land over to the mouth of the creek on the evening of the summer solstice, you have the rise of the Pleiades constellation, also an important constellation in Native American belief system. And, and um, they, they used it in agriculture for timing the um, plantings. And it just, you know, all around the world, the Pleiades has a very special meaning to ancient cultures and its conjunction rising on the evening of the summer solstice uh, sunrise is something that's noticed not just in this region, but I mentioned Gary Urton, professor of uh, uh, anthropology at Harvard. He documented the same belief among the Incans, the same phenomenon of the summer solstice sunrise uh, in conjunction with the rise of Pleiades in the same position on that evening. Um, so. Very, very interesting. Um, now, if we take the reciprocal of the uh, summer solstice sunrise and we go across the creek and from the mouth of the creek over the point of land, what we have is the winter solstice sunset. And here you see the date is set at 1221, um, just before sunset at 520 in the evening, the sun goes down aligned with the um, 
mouth of the creek as and and lined up over over Dan's camera point. So I don't think either of these things were lost on the native population. I think they they recognized this um, and honored it. And what's interesting is the reciprocal, and this is also something that Professor um, documented and and confirmed. But in the evening of the uh, winter solstice sunset, you actually have a galactic alignment with that same area. So the Milky Way um, comes into alignment with the place that the sun set on the shortest day of the year, the winter solstice. So to me, and again, if we look at the 237, that's very, very close to what was on uh, Curtis Hoffman's chart for what we'd expect that bearing to be um, for the solstices, for the uh, Pleiades, and for the galactic alignment that happens in conjunction with the solstice. So to me, this is very strong evidence that speaks for itself about why the dance camera point was such um, in, of such importance to the native population, why in some ways uh, it could almost be seen as in a way like an axis Monday, um, a, a point around which their belief system revolved. Um, certainly the astronomy associated with it is significant and I think it speaks to um, a, a very sophisticated belief system tying together earth, water, and sky. And Native Americans had that um, three-dimensional worldview. We don't have it so much today in modern society, but I think it's an important thing to, uh, to incorporate. Now, uh, we're gonna finish up by, um, I see we're almost up to an hour, about a few more minutes here. Uh, we're gonna look at the site here in Woodstock, um, Lewis Hollow site. Uh, up on Overlook Mountain, which is a really important site for many different reasons. Um, the, uh, you know, Overlook Mountain's got the KT Dam Monastery up there. It's the center of Tibetan Buddhism in the United States. It was also found to be a sacred mountain by the Onondaga Council of 1979. They came and met and, and designated Overlook Mountain as a sacred mountain. Uh, we know the mountain was used for many, many thousands of years. Uh, Native Americans documented there for 4,000 years ago, rock shelters. Um, they used it as a tunnel hunting camps. And we know that the bluestone quarry workers were there in the mid uh, and, and late 19th century, uh, exploiting the bluestone to be sent down to New York City. So it's basically a serial use area used by many groups of people for many purposes over great periods of time, but you can break it down. You can break down those cultural uh, activities and you know, from, the, from the Native Americans to the resource ex exploitation by the um, early uh, settlers, the land surveyors cutting the land up for the Hurtenberg patent and, and Livingston subdivisions, uh, you know, lots of lumber, the mountains were denuded if you look at uh, old photographs of Woodstock, the historical society showing what the town looked like a hundred years ago. There's no trees. So all the mountainsides are empty halfway up and everything is field. So um, we know that they took a lot of lumber. Uh, they took a lot of bluestone. Um, we know that Irish quarry workers who were immigrants worked those quarries and lived in a village up in Lewis Hollow. And we know that there was a tourist industry that also took place um, with the Irish quarry workers and their wives actually uh, hiking up the mountain to work at the Overlook Mountain House when that was operating in the late uh, 19th and early 20th century. So uh, a lot of use up there. Um, and to get a handle on it, you kind of want to map things out so you know what's what. This is a, a GIS survey that was done by Susan Sweeney of the New York State Museum uh, back in 2008. And she sent this to me and I kind of looked at it for a year. Um, or I look, she sent it to me and nothing really jumped out at me except that there are these rows of smaller Karens um, and, uh, and six large Karens, which I ended up mapping out based on Dave, David Holden saying, well, maybe those large Karens and serpent walls are a constellation. And I was a little skeptical of that. And I, I, I basically plotted where the, um, the six largest constructions. So um, let me just go back here. You have, if you go by the key, um, you have six of the large cairns, the red dots. You've got two serpent walls, serpent effigy walls up to the highest level here. You've got 46 of the smaller cairns documented. And then you've got these two spring houses over here, uh, kind of not too far from the, the stream. Um, so like I said, nothing really jumped out at me, but based on Dave's suggestion, I decided to 
map just the large, the eight large constructions because it was more manageable. Uh, and there were only six large cairns and two serpent walls. All these measure between 60 and 100 feet in length. So these are all big, big constructions. And we're gonna look and see what they look like. But what I did was I simply connected the dots between them in the only logical way that seemed once I plotted them. Um, here's what it looks like on the topographical map where those constructions are. Um, on the ground, this is what they look like. You've got a, a two serpent effigy walls. Uh, you're seeing one of them on the top right. You're seeing uh, one of the great Karens, uh, two of the great Karens, three of the great Karens shown up down below there. Uh, a little closer look at the serpent effigy wall number one. There's an identical one to it right over there. Uh, the heads face away, the tails point towards each other. Uh, this wall has not held up nearly as well as the other one. It's got uh, quite a bit of, of um, destruction to it, um, but they are of the same length. They have the same size uh, boulder that represents the head, and they're just curving walls that are non-enclosures. Uh, so what, you know, what purpose do they serve? None really other than perhaps symbolic um, or, or uh, uh, you know, some belief system. Um, here we have some of the great Karens, this one. We actually had a tribal preservation officer, not only Doug Harris, but Sherry White from the Stockbridge Band of Mohican came and looked at this uh, many years ago and said it resembled the burial mound of her ancestors, um, was interested in maybe doing ground penetrating radar uh, to see if there's a cyst or any of the earth was disturbed below it. Uh, here we have great Karen, um, five, which has a bit of a um, uh, kidney bean shape to it. Most of these large Karens, or all of them, I should say, have down slope retaining walls that I believe are built to you know, prevent gravity from pulling these things the down the mountain over time and allow the rubble and the stones within them to be built up. So this thing is like nearly 15 feet tall and, and like I said, 60 feet long. And when I took that configuration of these locations and mapped it out and mirrored it and compared it to the constellations in the Northern Hemisphere, one of them really jumped out at me as, as closely matching. And it was Draco, the serpent or the snake constellation, which I had no knowledge about before I uh, started researching um, this, this uh, petroform on the mountain. And when I put it up next to the Draco, uh, constellation in the sky, I was quite astounded at how close they actually matched. Um, and I, I, you know, I wondered if this was a representation of Draco uh, on the ground. And I believe it very well could be. When you put the coordinates, uh, let me just mention that Draco, once I started researching it, it turns out that Draco is a, a prominent constellation in many cultures, and it's been represented in, in a few other locations with constructions on the ground. What you're seeing here is actually in Cambodia, Angkor Wat and the layout of their temples also in some ways mirrors um, the configuration of Draco. Uh, there are some other uh, examples of constellations, this one not Draco, but Scorpio and Libra uh, in Wisconsin, a gentleman named Herman Bender uh, documented these uh, in the 90s. Another gentleman named Lee Pendleton, or Pennington down in Georgia um, believes that in the stone fort down there, there are representations, not just of Draco, but also of large, uh, big and little dipper. And it's also been said that a portion of the serpent mound in Ohio also conforms to a section of the constellation Draco. Um, hard to say whether that's what it is representing, but there is a bit of a correlation. Uh, David Johnson, who I uh, mentioned earlier, uh, as, as um, looking at the hydraulic features at some of these sites, uh, mapped a site in New Hampshire that also appeared to be great Karens that were mapping um, the Big Dipper or Ursa Major. Uh, so, so it's a pattern that we see around the world. What was interesting, and I began to say, is when you put the coordinates of the constellation, um, excuse me, if you put the coordinates of the um, location of the petroform on Overlook in Lewis Hollow into an astronomy software program, what you see is above that site is always Draco. It's always prominent in the sky day or night because it's a northern uh, circumpolar constellation that never goes below the horizon. 
And it's always circling around a point in the sky that is celestial north, where the Earth's axis is pointing to, uh, now marked by the North Star. So, you know, you have to ask when viewed as a geoglyph from above, this component petroform uh, mirrors the position of Draco. And in the software, it shows that um, it, the constellation appears uh, in the sky above that formation all the time. So to me, it makes the mountain a bit of a beacon uh, for anybody in its view shed to wanna know where Celestial North is. They just have to look at the mountain and overlook is the beacon of Celestial North for any group of people even today, who are in its view shed, look towards the mountain, you're looking towards um, the direction of north and in the sky above it, the direction of celestial north. Uh, I think it makes a lot of sense. Very recently, just uh, a month or two ago, a researcher named Mark Carlotto took up where I left off, and he really wanted to understand how closely these petroforms on the ground uh, correlated to the constellation in the sky. And uh, Mark is a uh, aerospace engineer. He's a mathematician, a statistician. His whole thing was statistically see how close this matches. And he looked at Anchor Watt. He looked at um, uh, the correlation known as the um, Orion, uh, the Giza correlation between the Great Pyramids and the Belt of Orion. Uh, he looked at a few of the other uh, constellations that are built in structures on the ground. And he found that many of them actually are correlated quite closely. In this case, he found a match of about 82% between what's on Overlook Mountain and the actual form of the constellation in the sky. And he thought that was pretty close, considering that anybody who would try to build a, a form on the ground that matched what they saw in the sky, um, you know, they're not gonna get the angles right. They're not gonna get the perspective right. It's gonna be skewed. And he actually, used the minimum point of the skewing when viewed from the ground to tentatively date the site at, at, at um, 1000 BC, because he said that was when the skewing visually was at its minimum. So, uh, you know, I don't know if that's a valid way, but um, we're gonna look a little bit more at the dating, but I really appreciated him taking this work up and, and using his skills to understand how closely this petroform on Overlook actually matched the uh, constellation in the sky. And uh, as I was mentioning earlier, it was a very important constellation for many cultures, the ancient Chinese, the ancient Greeks, the ancient Egyptians, the Norse, um, the Persians, they all recognized Draco as a circumpolar constellation that um, always spun around the position of celestial north. And um, even, even to the point where at one point, uh, the third tail in the star of Draco, Thuban was in the position closest to celestial north. So that was pole star about 5,000 years ago, Thuban in Draco. So uh, also another important consideration. Um, and this is all goes to uh, uh, pre-Christian mythology of the tree of life and the serpent. And to me, in my eyes, that tree is the uh, axis of the earth and that serpent is Draco coiled around it, always spinning around the point of celestial north. And when the ancients watched that, and they watched it closely. When that configuration changed, um, you know, it 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 changed. It meant the changing of an era, um, and a lot of their timing um, in their belief systems were tied to the changes of celestial north. And they either read it as something portending something very good, like a new golden age, or something very bad, like a a, a destructive cataclysm. And um, that was kind of the reading they took of that. Now. To kind of bring you right up to date, last September we had um, a team here in Lewis Hollow taking what's called samples for optical stimulated luminescence. And this is a new, fairly new procedure for dating sites to determine when sunlight last shone on the minerals in the soil or in a stone. So here we have um, Professor James Feathers from Washington, uh, University of Washington, Washington State and Dr. Florin and Dr. Kundik from uh, Stony Brook University and a team of uh, volunteers came up and took samples, both stone and soil, from two different constructions um, in, in Lewis Hollow, uh, a great cairn and a smaller cairn. Um, and they, are, they, they were sent, or, or excuse me, um, the samples were brought to the lab 
to be analyzed. It takes a little over a year and the, soil, the samples have to be gathered in complete darkness. Uh, here you see some of the documentation of the site. And what you see there is a little dosimeter. So to get to where they took the samples, they had to peel back and see how far down below the surface of the earth this structure actually goes. And you can see quite a bit of dirt and they had to go down about uh, 20 centimeters to get to a point where they reached the bottom course of stone. And then they would um, set up a structure, go inside the structure, take their samples in darkness and uh, you know with a headlamp, uh, a red light headlamp, and um, package them in uh, opaque containers and um, send them to the lab. Now here you can see uncovering of one of these shelters with Dr. Uh, Feathers and one of the um, one of the other researchers in there, they've been in there for about an hour. And now we're uncovering uh, all the tarps that were needed to make this thing completely dark inside. I know we've run over about 10 minutes, but I uh, hope everybody's sticking with us. We're getting near the end. Um, you know, there's like six or seven tarps before you even get to the tent. Uh, playing a little glitchy, but there you go. Finally get to the tent. And uh, here we just have the uh, <laughs> them emerging after after being in there for about an hour and digging down uh, below the top courses of stone to get two stones that are well within the center of this structure. Um, and what you have to realize is um, there are two different types of samples that are taken. One is soil and one is stone. And the stone sample is more precise dating and the soil sample is more accurate dating. So one is gonna give you a window in time um, and one is gonna give you uh, how small that window is. So I think it's more important to have accuracy, which is from the soil samples as opposed to um, precision, which is from the stone samples. Uh, the dosimeter that was left there, and um, I think I was mentioning that just earlier, there's a little dosimeter that's left at the uh, collection site. That is there now. That will be retrieved in the beginning of September and sent to the lab. And they use that to help calibrate the dating in the laboratory. Um, there was a uh, site that was dated with OSL um, in Pennsylvania called the Ole Hill site. And the results came back 770 BCE, plus or minus 300 years. So definitely a Native American site because it's certainly pre-contact by thousands of years. Um, I'm gonna finish here by showing you what took place, not this past December, but in 2019, we had the uh, Ramapo Lenape come up and do a uh, winter sol solstice sunrise ceremony. They asked after they'd come and visited the site, they asked if they could come back and do their ceremony here. They did it in front of this uh, formation which they identified, they picked the spot and they identified this as an altar. Um, the, two, the two vertical stones with the stones filling the gap in between was what they described as an altar. They also said that it was a passageway to the underworld and that by putting the stones in it, the Native Americans were helping regulate and control the flow of energy from the underworld into the world we live in. So. Um, that's Chief Mann right there with the headdress, uh, Paul Tobin behind him, uh, some of the other members. This was the altar that they set out uh, in front of the stone altar. Um, and here, here's where we were uh, kind of freezing ourselves at 10 degrees on uh, early December morning, uh, trying to keep warm and honoring the sol solstice sun as it, um, you know, on the shortest days of the year, when now from this point forward, the days start to get longer. So. Um, uh, a young person there taking that in, understanding, uh, trying to understand the meaning and import that. So uh, finishing up, I'm just gonna say that um, uh, the old Herbert Kraft uh, paradigm is, is slowly going to the wayside. Uh, William Romain uh, from Ohio State University says it's clear to him that the Northeast has been totally and inappropriately marginalized by the mainstream and that the Northeast is right up there with the Southwest, Midwest, Effigy Mound, Lower Mississippi Valley, and other traditions in terms of 
archaeoastronomical alignments, sensitivity to landscape features, and cosmological understanding. So that's what we're hoping is going to take hold. Um, with that new paradigm, there's a new set of tools. I would recommend going on to YouTube, Googling, or, or, or on YouTube, put in triad of technologies, and you'll see this new wonderful technology that we're bringing to bear on solving this mystery, combining 3D handheld LIDAR scanning with GIS mapping technology, and then bringing it all into a, um, a an astronomy program like Stellarium, which will allow you to watch the 3D configurations on the maps with the sky in the background accurately depicted. Um, so I'm wrapping up here. Just want to mention Overlook Mountain Center. Uh, We've got a website. We do tours and steward the land up in Lewis Hollow if people are interested in visiting. Uh, NERA is an organization you can uh, become a member of, attend their fall and spring conferences, which are beginning again this fall after a hiatus due to COVID. If you are into this stuff, the uh, New England Antiquities Research Association is kind of ground zero for um, where all sites are reported. Um, and I, my publisher would be upset if I didn't mention my book, which a lot of this research is in. And you can get that uh, at local bookstores in Woodstock to avoid having to uh, buy it online. And that wraps things up. And I thank everybody for your attention. Sorry for running over a little. And if anyone has additional questions, I'm happy to take them at this point. Okay. Thank you, Glenn. Gonna, could you, could you put down share content? I'm taking control back. There you go. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So thank you very much, Glenn. I think we'll maybe say 10 minutes for any other additional questions, perhaps. And um, you know, you can always follow the Historical Society on Instagram, Facebook, and go to our website, which is at the top of the chat. But go ahead. Any questions? We have about 10 minutes, let's say. Looks like you're getting a resounding uh, applause in the chat box, though. So oh well, thank thanks everybody. I appreciate that. And um yeah, if you, you know, you can you can certainly get a hold of me through the overlookmountain.org website um, or through uh, Richard or you know, um, uh, yeah, always uh, always hearing from people about sites that they have that they want me to come and look at. There's a gentleman who's got a site up in Fleischmann's that's really impressive. I didn't have in time to include it in in this presentation, but it's just got amazing altars and and uh, um, you know serpents and effigies. Um, so do, yeah, do definitely. quick question. Do you have a sense of how far um, the native people would have traveled with the stones from point A to point B to build these structures? Any well, ideas? that's a great question. I, I didn't get it. I didn't so much get into the alignment aspects, but there are some long distance lines. There's something called the Hamanasa line that begins at Council Rock at Montauk Point and goes um, at least to the Devil's Tombstone in Stony Clove between Phoenicia and Hunter, exactly on that winter solstice to sunrise, summer solstice to sunset bearing. All along it are constructions through Connecticut. Um, there's even constructions at Montgomery Place on the east shore of the Hudson where it crosses the river. Uh, there's a really major site where it uh, intersects with another solstice line um, running from the summer solstice to sunrise. Uh, at a in, place in Red Hook. So yes, there, there in are- In your imagination or in your knowledge, would you think that the native people brought the stone from elsewhere to build up in Lewis Hollow or did they use what was the, already there? And how does that relate to the rest of this um, line of um, stones? Well, think? if you walk around up in Lewis Hollow, you'll notice there are very few stones in the ground. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost all the stones have been picked out uh, to be used in these walls uh, and in these constructions by who and when, uh, you know, we still don't know that for sure. Um, but but um, I, I would say, um, you know, certainly they came locally. They didn't quarry them at great distances and bring them in. They were either taken from the stream nearby or dug right out of the ground. Can you put the name of your book up one more time or can you tell uh, someone wants to know the name of your book? Oh, um, Spirits in Stone, Secrets of Megalith America. If you do a, a um, a search with my name and Simon and Schuster. You should see the publisher page. It's got. Um, I've got two other books as well: um, Mysteries of the Ancient Past and Lost Knowledge of the Ancients, that kind of document the evolution of human technology, civilization, and consciousness um, through the eyes of a bunch of different researchers around the world. So, there, uh, is it? 
There is a question in the chat that I don't quite, I don't see what the question is, but it refers to Orion. It's up near the top from Michael McDonald. If you have, if you can I can see open, that. Michael has his hand up. I can open his mic. Well, um, he could do that. Yes, you could do that too. That might be easier. Great. Well, now, I, now, I, now I see the chat on the right and all the questions coming in. I'm sorry, I didn't see that before. Um, yes, Go ahead, Michael. Michael. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, I've got about 30 acres in Stone Ridge, which is just uh, up the ridge from uh, where the longhouse was in Marbletown. I believe it was the, the largest longhouse ever found. It's at the headwaters of Tongor Brook, which feeds the Esopus. And I, I, after looking at what you've said this, this evening, I believe I have what might be miles of serpent wall and what seems to be correlating to Orion, although the correlation is probably more like the winter maker um, that, you know, incorporated, you, you're probably, um, uh, conversant with the winter maker as a Native American I've constellation. Heard it too. Yeah. Okay, so I seem to have a winter maker star map. Um, and one of the mounds, one of the cairns in particular, seems to have a lot of uh, energy, for lack of a better word. It also seems to be a spiral and it has a void at its center and it correlates to one of the stars in Orion that is actually a group of stars. Um, three stars and there are three spiral wing, wings out of it. So um, I've, I'm an architect, I've mapped uh, these and a number of other formations on the property. So first of all, I'm heartened to see that, that the star map thing is in, in conversation because it seemed to me to be pretty evident after I looked at it for a while. Um, any way to follow up with you on that? Uh, absolutely, Michael, get, get a hold of me. Um can email me at cliffrover at aol.com. So basically just one word, Cliff Rover, like mm -hmm. it sounds. Um, or, or, or um, you know, GM Kreisberg, first, first initial, middle, initial, last name at Gmail. Uh, I'd like to look at it. Um, I, I think um, Evan Pritchard, who also researches these things and is of Native American descent, would also probably have an interest in coming and visiting to see what is there, because it sounds like something that may be um, a ceremonial landscape. Yeah, seems to be. Uh, we had a member of the Lenape tribe from um, Oklahoma visit, um, and he wanted to perform ceremony on the site. Uh, one of the people who uh, invited well, we gotta, him. We got to move along here. We're running out of time. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, get, okay, a, get a hold of me offline, you. Michael. We can discuss it more. Thanks. Cool. And Janine, you got one from Jamie Ricky. I think that about wrap us. Jamie, you have a question? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, I'm in northwestern New Jersey um, in the Appalachian Ridge, where it takes a jog along the New York New Jersey border. Um, I've not actually seen the turtle effigy on top of the mountain, um, but it's a high west facing vista where you can see on a clearest day down to Delaware Water Gap and certainly up into the Catskills. Um, we're also near the headwaters of the Walk Hill and near um, what's called a prehistoric mining site um, called the Ring Quarry and a Native American village site called the Black Creek site. But there is a turtle effigy um, that as described to me was unmistakable um, on that ridge line. I was just wondering if there's anything been documented down in this area. Um, some things, but nothing that I can specifically tell you about. I just know there have been things reported from that border area of New York, New Jersey and Pennsylvania. Um, and and you know a little bit east of there near the, actually, <laughs> It's in a different presentation, but if you look at the, you know, there was an, you know, New Jersey used to be East Jersey and West Jersey. When it became one state, they redrew the northern boundary. And if you look at that borderline running from Port Jervis over to the Hudson, it's exactly a winter solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset angle. So I think the commission in England 
that were looking to settle the so-called New Jersey, New York border war, which was really just a, a dispute over who was paying taxes to who. Um, they, they redrew that line and to me, to avoid any arguments, they decided to draw it where they were, you know, to where from in, in the commission report, it says from the place where the three rivers come together, which is Port Jervis, to the banks of the Hudson, draw a straight and true line. And it just happens to be at the angle of this uh, winter solstice sunrise, summer solstice sunset, which to me was something nobody could argue with. We drew the line based on where the position of the sun was so that nobody could really have a dispute with it. Uh, it is what it is. Um, so yeah, all along that line, there are some really interesting sites, um, way, way on to uh, um, Table Rock in Sterling Forest. So it's a little bit east of where you're talking about, but that- Well, I'm, that, I'm, uh, very, I'm very close to way, way on to, Okay, um, yep. There's something called right, the Wayway right Yonder. Right in that Vernon Valley. Yep, and there's something actually called the Way Way Yonder Calendar Stone. I haven't been to Correct. it, but um, uh, uh, there is a uh, Linda Zimmerman who wrote a wonderful book on these sites that I recommend, um, mis mysterious sites, mysterious stone sites of uh, Northern Jersey and Southern New York. Um, so a shout out to Linda Zimmerman. So there's one last, about, last, oh. last question there. Is it a simple question that you can ask, answer in the chat there? Uh, locations of long houses been mapped, documented? Um, no, I wouldn't have that. I would say New York State Museum, look through the archives. Um, I, I wouldn't know um, locations of long houses or habitation areas. Okay. It's an important question, though. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. This has been great, Glenn. Thank you for um, sharing your knowledge with us. Um, can never get enough of the this amazing information. So thank you. All right, All right everybody. Thanks, thanks Janine. Want to mention right. YouTube? Uh, I put it in the chat okay. that the this will be on YouTube in about two weeks. Uh, the whole thing, you can see it again and again and again. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you, Richard, for reminding. Take care. All right. Good night, everybody.